Hello and welcome to the Where Does It Come From podcast. Today is a very special episode. We have two guests with us. Um, one is Asha Bush from Cardi London and the second one, Paul Baisley, um, a very well-known and famous actor. Um, but I'll let them tell you a little bit more about themselves. So first of all, Paul, would you like to talk to us about your background and your interests? Um, Okay, well, um, I'm um, an Indian heritage actor from London. My parents came over from Chennai in the 60s, um, and I was born in London in the late 60s, and um, I've been acting for 33 years, maybe. I started in 1989, Um, and yeah, I've been... um, acting ever since I've, d- I've done film tv theater radio uh, audio books so I've, I've I've been lucky worked quite a lot and now I am lucky enough to be playing Mahatma Gandhi at the National Theatre. Thank you Paul. Asha do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Well um, I was teaching ethnic minority pupils for two decades in Greater Manchester and they included asylum seekers and refugees as well uh, but ever since I came to this country 40 years ago, uh, I've been involved in many volunteer work, and most of them involved uh, community harmony, religious and cultural uh, activities. So I've always been drawn to that sort of uh, um, domain, uh, and mainly through music, uh, conversation with pu- uh, high school children, spiritual awareness, uh, so that to break the barriers of hatred and that was my aim and I, it, it still is and you have some background in your family and heritage don't you yes. in that area so I'm, I'm lucky to have been born in a family and they all follow uh, the main 18 constructive programs that was so starting from it my maternal uncle and my own uncles and aunts and my parents uh, they were all involved in those activities. So I was surrounded by, uh, by these values. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, well, we got you here today, both of you, to talk a little bit about um, Cardi, about the play that Paul has mentioned where he plays Gandhi, um, and really to have a conversation about all these different values and those, these different things that um, we've ex- been exploring. So I think it will be a really interesting conversation. So thank you both so much for joining me here. Um, Paul, perhaps it'd be best if you tell us a little bit about The Father and the Assassin and what's happening with that. Well, it's a play um, called Father and the Assassin by Anupama Chandrasekhar. Um, she is a Chennai-based um, playwright. And she wanted to, she, I think she was interested in um, the relationship between um, uh, God say that the man who who um, assassinated Gandhi and Gandhi and and I think she was quite interested on in putting words in her mouth in in looking at how extremism develops, violence develops, and the polarization that is currently so um, uh, extreme in our society. <clears throat> and I think she wanted to use. God say as a lens to look at modern day polarization and extremism. So she looked into his life, researched his life. It's quite hard to find out much about his early life. And she thought about maybe using the play as a way for him to speak in a way, to put his case so that the audience could listen and say to themselves, where do I stand? Do I think, you know, he, he sort of basically the premise of the play is he, at the beginning, he says to the audience, by the end of the play, you will want to put up statues in my honour because I did the world a favour by killing Gandhi. And it's up to the audience. What I love about her is she's not an, um, a playwright who hits you over the head with her opinions. Mm-hmm. She asks questions and she says, well, what do you think? What do you think about what he says? And then she puts Gandhi all the way through the play as well so that you can see the way Gandhi thought and lived. And at the end, I think she asks the audience to make up their minds. Um, so it's a very, I think, quite a fair 
look at different points of view from within Indian society and then via that our society in Britain as well because you know it's a quite a universal play I think because these are universal themes. Mm. No the play is really powerful I was fortunate enough to see it a, a couple of weeks ago and mm. I actually went with a friend who's of Indian heritage and we both brought quite different things back from the play as you say I, I very much saw it as a reflection of our society in the UK and the Western world kind of thing. My friend saw it slightly differently, so it was mm. very interesting. I mean, and I found there were some parts of it that were uncomfortable because they were frightening, I suppose, um, thinking about some of the splits in society. And then there was the humour that very much lightened it as well. Yeah, so I mean, I think, you know, that's, that's, that's one of uh, Anu Palmer's... Um, uh, her, her strength is that she can put thread humour through the play so that you can see the humanity of all the people involved really mm, yeah and the end was very powerful I won't say any more because I really hope people will want to go to the National Theatre in London and watch the play because it's on until um, June the 18th June the 18th fantastic so we, yes you must go and see Asha's got have two weeks. booked haven't you Asha be going soon um how did it feel, Paul, to play uh, Gandhi? Well, it's um, strange. Um, I have studied, it's one of those things, and it happens to actors occasionally, where you feel like you've been preparing for 20 years to play a part, because I studied Gandhi. I've been drawn to Gandhi since I was a child, you know, since probably watching the, the Richard Attenborough film um, with my parents, you know, all those years ago. Um, and I, my meditation teacher is a man called Eknath Ishran, who was from Kerala, he's passed now, but he wrote a book um, in the 80s called Gandhi the Man, which was about Gandhi's spiritual life, um, as opposed to his political life. And I was very drawn to that book, I read it 20 years ago, and I actually have been lucky enough to do, I've done quite a lot of audio books for Eknath Ishram. So I then did the audio book of that book. Um, I've done courses on Gandhian nonviolence, uh, kind of linked to that um, back in the, in, the, in the early 2000s. So I know a lot about the subject matter and I've studied him as a person and his personal philosophies. Um, so when this opportunity came up, uh, firstly, I wasn't expecting it because I knew this play was existed because it was being worked on last year, but I didn't think um, I would be asked to play him. I'm a bit tall to play Gandhi. Um, that's what my dad keeps telling me anyway. And um, so I never thought I'd be within the casting, but I, Indu Rubasingham, the director, knows me. And I think in the end, she thought I might, she was interested in someone capturing the essence of Gandhi rather than doing an impersonation of Gandhi. And so then I felt, because she was interested in that, I was more a, a better fit then, because rather than trying to just look exactly like him, it's, it's, it's about trying to find the essence of who that man was. Um, and so it was a strange thing because what's so strange is that he is still an icon in the sense of you can talk to anyone. And while I've discovered this, literally anyone in this country, someone who works in a shop, in the station, anywhere at all, someone coming to fix your roof, everyone knows who Mahatma Gandhi is. It's a strange thing that he's well, maybe not so strange, that he's stayed in the culture very, very strongly, partly because of the way he dressed, partly because of what he did, partly because of what he stood for. Um, and there's very, very few people in history. You know, you can think of people on the other end of the extreme, like Hitler, say, for instance, might be someone else like that. So when I've said to people, I'm playing Gandhi, everyone has a reaction. Everyone goes, oh, because everyone has a picture in their head of Gandhi. Um, whether they know anything else about him at all, is, it, doesn't, is, it doesn't matter. So that was quite strange. But, but I felt that um, what I just wanted to do was, I, saw, I just read a lot of his stuff. I, I, I read Hind Swaraj again. I read uh, My Experience with Truth again. I watched, uh, there's a wonderful documentary called Mahatma, but, which was, I think, made by the Indian government. It's like four hours long. You can watch it on YouTube. 
and it's got virtually all the, the newsreel footage of him that there is. And I watched and watched and watched the way he interacted with people. And of course, it's all silent, but you can see his physicality with people, the way he touched people all the time, the way he laughed all the time. Um, and yeah, and so then I just tried to sort of, for the last three months before rehearsal started, just kind of immerse myself in his world. I also watched a lot of Desmond Tutu and the Dalai Lama because I felt that they were modern uh, versions in a way of him. And Desmond Tutu died while I was, you know, right at the beginning of the year. And so there was lots of footage of him. There's a beautiful film called Joy that you can watch at the moment, which is about him spending a week with the Dalai Lama. And what I thought was interesting was their body language was just the same as Gandhi's in those newsreels. The way they hold each other's hands, the way they touch each other, the way they laugh all the time. And then suddenly they're talking about a spiritual, very deep spiritual messages. And they don't need to worry about apologizing for that. They, they just can be laughing and then they're talking about God straight away. Mm. Um, so I watched lots of them and that really helped actually. So, and then started rehearsals and hope for the best. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, until you mentioned about the, the height, I hadn't even thought about it. So you obviously <laughs> carried the essence on. And one thing I have mentioned to several people is you had a, a sort of giggle when you played Gandhi, which seemed really genuine, you know, a bit of that was part of your characterization. Is it? Well, he a... laughed. You can see him in those newsreels. He's always laughing. Mm. And there's people around him are always laughing. He was obviously really funny. And I think he said, there was one point he said, one of his direct quotes is he said, if I didn't have a sense of humour, I would have killed myself long ago. So, you know, he was someone who was a realist about the terrible problems that uh, the people around him faced. But he also, I think because he'd given everything, he'd, you know, he talks about you, 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 the, the results are not yours, the results are God's. So you... That's the central teaching of the Bhagavad Gita, you know, is that you you do the work to the best of your ability and then the result is God's. And I think because of that, because he completely surrendered that, he could find humour in the humanity of all the people around him and the situations around him so that he could carry on laughing even in the midst of terrible, terrible death and destruction. You know, he, he could still, an injustice, he could still have human relationships where you know he he loved other people he loved people mm. yeah there's, a, there's a definitely a lesson just in that isn't there um just talk moving on I and mean, one thing that you had to do in the play Paul was to sit on the stage spinning cotton and that's where Asha comes into it um Asha would you like to tell us a bit about spinning cotton generally and, and how did you meet Paul uh, Kadi London informed me um, that there is a request from National Theatre to teach um, the character playing Gandhi uh, how to spin the big wheel. Um, now, if I had come face to face real Gandhi, I would have run mine or maybe fall in, in his feet and paid my respect. But I'm sure he would have asked me to teach him as well. He was so humble and open. But being honest, I, I was not sure how I would approach Paul because he's such a, an accomplished actor. Uh, I really was nervous, I must confess. But I was I, nervous too. <laughs> <laughs> but but when, when he walked into the room, I could see he's so humble and polite. And most importantly, he showed right attitude to learn. Learn from anyone, doesn't matter who I was. And that made it easy. And you remember, Paul, the, the spindle had two uh, metal protector and we couldn't make it work. While I was struggling, he was continuously observing. And as you know, Joe, my mouth never shuts. <laughs> I keep talking to him about the history of Khadi, history of nonviolence movement. And that's how I, I could make myself feel easy. But yes, about spinning, I learned it when I was about seven and eight. So teaching other students, and if needed to even teach us how to spin was quite natural to me. Uh, so it was a pleasure. And I thought, because I believe in this ethos so much, this opportunity is not to be missed. 
So tell, tell us some more about um, your ethos and how the spinning fits in with that, Asha. Because, because my maternal grandfather toured with Gandhi, he followed him ever since. So my mother wore khadi ever since she was born. And so I, I was brought up wearing khadi since I was born. And, and, you know, all the constructive work and doing work for disadvantaged people uh, was very much ingrained in ourselves, in our minds and hearts. So all our actions followed that. So uh, khadi is one of the tools to serve people. And that has proved uh, it, it was the case. And because the government and other people stayed away from it, uh, we can see the uh, bad results of it as well. Because khadi is not just a cloth or a fabric. It's a way of life, way of thinking. And now you've taught Gandhi how to spin cotton. <laughs> how does that feel? <laughs> well, I'm honoured, I must say. I'm, I'm honoured. I'm sure you did an amazing job. Um, for anybody watching us on video, I'm actually wearing a Cardi scarf at the moment, and I'm sure Asha is wearing Cardi. And we're going to talk a little bit more about Cardi as a fabric and way, way of life in a moment. Um, but I first wanted to um, talk a little bit about a little bit more about the production, the father and the assassin. Um, for those of you who didn't, who weren't aware, where does it come from? The social enterprise I run. We um, supplied the cardi cotton and wool fabrics that uh, the were used by the National Theatre in the production, and we worked with a charity partner called Cardi London and various social enterprises in India, including um, Mishika Crafts, Udyog Bharti Cooperative and Kamiya, which is in um, Kush. We worked with all of them to provide the fabrics. They're all hand produced by artisans in the traditional ways. So um, we were really proud to do that, really proud that Cardi London and Where Does It Come From were involved in the production. And also very, it was, felt wonderful to work with an organization like the National Theatre who was so dedicated to authenticity. So first of all, Asha, can you tell us a little bit more about Cardi, all the people listening, and just um, talk about how it reflects Gandhi's views and way of life? Well, uh, Cardi is hand-spun, hand-woven fabric. Now, before the Industrial Revolution, the whole world used the fabric of linen, everything produced by hands. So this is not something new. It has been going on for millennia. Gandhi only rediscovered it. And the reason is when he came back from South Africa and he saw, he was engaged in political uh, freedom fight, but he could see that India was economically bankrupt, socially unequal and spiritually just broken. And he could realize that just political freedom will not sustain in this such a poor, not just economically, but poor country in every way. So he, he did say that I wanted to find a tool to fight against the British rule, but non-violent means. And he saw that in Khadi. Why? Because from farming to fashion and cloth, the whole process involves looking after the environment, involving the millions who are starving. And that was his way of leveling up. The society was so unequal, so he reinvented the charkha and gave it to the lower and the barristers and, and to the poor people, women, children, girls, boys, everyone. So Khadi became the emblem of freedom movement. And that was his way of saying Khadi and cottage industry will bring India back to the on screen. So we missed you a little bit there, Asha. Asha, can you just say that last sentence again? Because it went a bit wobbly. Okay. So he, he, where was that? <laughs> he, he brought it to the, the people. Yeah. He, in other words, he reinvented Khadi, which gave people confidence to rediscover their, their age old skills. And they began to produce 
Khadi for all occasions, for everyday use. And that was his plan. And if, if that didn't happen, India would have struggled. By boycotting foreign goods, they became more self-sufficient, not just in terms of fab producing fabric, but in terms of making people realize that they can earn their own living. So I would say Khadi was the first tool to introduce to Indian people who were just not able to sustain themselves. As you say, it's reintroduced as well, isn't it? Wasn't yeah. it? Because if you think about, I mean, it made no sense when you look at it from a point of the future that the cotton is grown in one place and then transported across the world to be turned into fabric in the UK and then transported all the way back again for people to wear in India. It makes absolutely no sense. And that, that India suffered double whammy. While exporting cotton, they had to pay export duty while importing um, material made in British cotton mills they had to pay import duties mm -hmm. and therefore when he went to India he saw almost naked people mm -hmm. or people with just one or two pairs of clothes and that made him realize yeah it makes no sense and the other the other thing from my limited um knowledge was about the rural versus the city as well wasn't it so all of these cooperatives such as Ujog Bharti that we work quite a lot with in Gujarat they were set up rurally to provide work for the millions and millions of rural people because they could work with their hands and provide you know, t turn these the farmed cotton into cloth in the rural areas without having having to be transported Ported to city, so it's creating jobs for marginalized people. So decentralization was the main ethos. <clears throat> he didn't have the terms environmentally friendly, but he, his his way of saying is farmers can grow cotton, people can gin the cotton, make it into you know spinnable cotton slivers, and. You can have spinning wheel in every house and people of all ages can operate them. Mm. You can have weavers in the town, in the village, and there you go. Yeah. It can be produced for, for fit for the king or the sweeper. Mm. Yeah, and there's no barriers. Anyone can do it, like you say. It's, there's no barriers. There's no, there's no. no trade you had to learn. So it's a, it's a wonderful thing. Thank you, Asha. You say it all so well. Um, Paul, I don't know how you, how did you feel about wearing the fabrics that Gandhi would have worn? Well, it was really useful. And what's great, I mean, <clears throat> Raja Shakiri, the, the designer, is, is an amazing designer. And she was absolutely, when you say committed to authenticity, that came from Raja, really. Um, and she was also interested in showing Gandhi because we see him first in 1917, where he was still dressed in a long dhoti and a kurta and a turban. And we see him make the journey towards uh, the short dhoti and, and just a, a shawl. Um, and that was because, as Asha said, he saw that people could only afford two pieces of cloth. And so he made the decision that he would wear just that as well so that he was with the people and he didn't ask other people to do it with him but he made it was a conscious decision to 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 only wear those things um and so to wear them in the play is wonderful because if you're doing a film for instance <clears throat> you might be stood in a village in India, actually doing it, filming. And you can look around, you can go, this is an Indian village, there's the sky, this is the heat. But on stage, you don't have anything real, really. You know, you have an audience in front of you, you have lights, you're in the dark. So every, anything that is authentic that you can hold on to is really valuable. And of course, costume is the, the central thing that you can hold on to. Um, and so as soon as we started our technical rehearsal, so you rehearse in the rehearsal room and I had a shawl and I had, you know, I just was wearing shorts and, you, you know, and then you step into the step onto the stage and you're wearing the actual fabric suddenly, you know, everything's ready for you. And I'm wearing his sandals and um, 
you just feel different. You just feel like a different person. And what was really interesting as well was to realize the power, this was where he's part of his genius, was that by wearing very little, it gave him immense power because he was talking to people who were wearing Western suits and, but he just was showing them by what he was wearing. <laughs> he was embodying it rather than having to make speeches about it. He just was doing it. And that's the genius of spinning as well. You know, Asher taught me spinning and I sit spinning now. And, and then once she taught me, I would sit, because it's much harder than it looks. <laughs> um, I would sit in rehearsals every day after she taught me. And I would always spend at least half an hour just doing some spinning when they didn't need me, you know. And they used to laugh because it was Gandhi in the corner spinning, literally. Um, but what was extraordinary was the physical, visceral feeling of creating thread from, from just a handful of cotton fiber. And I think what the genius of that was and what he understood was that if you make, because our society is constant, Western society is about pushing people away from the land, away from the soil. If, you're, if you have your hands dirty, you're seen as low class. If, you gar if you're in the garden or in the fields, you're seen as low class. And if you're, if you're high class, you must be far away from the soil. You must, be far, you must just be using a pen or a laptop or, and, you know, and sitting in an office. And that's seen as a good thing. And he was trying to completely invert that picture. And so to make the lawyers and the barristers and the, whoever spin, what he was doing was bringing them back to the soil. He was saying, hold a piece of cotton in your hand that has grown in the soil and make it into a thread that you can wear. And to actually, you can talk about that, but to physically do it. I mean, I've never made thread in my life. And suddenly I was sitting there going, this is like magic. And what's interesting is when I'm doing it, all the cast would come up and go, oh, that's amazing. Look at what you're doing. You're making thread. And everyone has come at some point to watch me do it because it is a, it is a, it's, it's, it's that thing of decentralization. All of his, you know, it's really quietly revolutionary, turning the world on its head and saying, actually get to the, get your hands in the soil, you know, and, and by spinning, it's, it's, it's just a, it feels great when you're doing it, you know, and it feels calming. And sometimes when I'm on stage doing my little bit of spinning, which I don't do for very long, it's at the beginning of a scene, you've seen it. I want them, to, I don't want them to start. <laughs> just, 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 just wait, just let me do a bit more <laughs> before the scene starts. But can, can I just add, this is how he improved the profile of labor, because as Paul mentioned, we are ashamed of being labor and also the laborers because we as you said we class them as lower well he said if you are dependent on somebody's labor you are lower tolstoy also said that yeah. john ruskin also mentioned that that if you are dependent on other people to sweep your house or street you are lower so he and gandhi was the only person who could walk with just the loincloth to see the king and climb the stairs of Buckingham Palace. Nobody else would do it because he knew that he was the one who was doing the right thing. So others should be ashamed. It's really interesting. In his, in his speech, when there was inauguration of um, Hindu University in India, all the kings and the viceroys and all the officials came in finest attire and with jewelry. And he plainly looked at him and said, please remove these and just be like ordinary people. You are not reaching to them. Mm. You are starting your university and teaching them through English to Indian people. And you are wearing such expensive clothes. So he, he could say that because he had moral authority mm. by mm. implementing himself and following the rules, he was, he was not preaching. He was doing. 
yeah, same as Paul with the spinning. It's the, when you're doing it, it's different from watching someone else do it. I, I see everything that you've just been saying is part of this loss of connection, which I know Asher and I have talked about a lot of times, and it, and it all fits together. The sort of society that we live in now, <clears throat> excuse me, and the lack of connection with things. So like you say about the lack of connection with the land, but also I think our sort of consumerist economic model has been almost about pushing any knowledge of that dependency on the land, on creativity, on artisans, away from, from people. So they simply just walk into a shop and buy something. They don't think anything about what it's made of, what the impacts are on people and planet, or, or what's going to happen to that thing at the end of what, you know, when they finished it. And it's been really important to push that away from people's heads so that they basically keep buying to keep the economy moving with all the detrimental impacts that we know about on the, the people, the farmers, the workers, the planet, and, and I would argue also our mental health too. But it's also about consciously de-skilling the population. If you de-skill people, if you take away their, their the knowledge of how to make clothes or how to cook for themselves or how to grow food, then they have to use money to buy these things in the shops they don't have an option anymore so it's not like people have a choice people don't have any of those skills anymore and so until we can show people that those skills are worthwhile re relearning people are disempowered because the society wants them that way this is because when you said earlier oh it makes no sense to transport cotton across the world well, it makes a huge amount of sense if you want to make lots and lots of money. So, so, so it makes no sense in the, for, in the, for, for the environment or for our mental health or for the most of the population, but it makes sense for, for the small percentage of people who are making huge amounts of money from it. So, so I think that's the, that is the prophetic nature of what Gandhi and Gandhians were doing is to say, it's not just about India in the 1940s. Now we need it more than ever. Now we need to get people back onto the land farming again. You know, regenerative agriculture depends on people being on the land, um, making our own clothes. Um, you know, the, the idea of Svadeshi, making things nearby, making things as nearby to you as, as possible, growing your food locally, making your food lo um, clothes locally. and so so this is absolute it's more relevant than ever funnily enough you know he was not just 50 years ahead of his time he was 100 years ahead of his time because now is when we really really need decentralization local democracy all of these things that he was talking about you know 100 years ago it's, it's extraordinary to read Hind Swaraj again and just to go well if we could do this right now we could save the planet definitely definitely it's almost like we didn't listen well yeah. enough the last time and it's just well we went the opposite direction yeah and so you know uh, and india went the opposite direction and so and the rest of the world had gone the opposite direction quite a long time before so but at the same time i think what's optimistic is that his people have spread out across the world and you know, that's why when Asher talks about constructive program, that was always, he felt that was the key, wasn't it? That was more important than obstructive program. He had the two arms of his movement because if you build constructive program wherever you go at the grassroots, then when this system crumbles, it's just ready. It's ready to go. And so the work you're doing in a way is the most important work, I think, because yes we need to uh, we need to uh, protest against destructive things that are happening but what you're doing is actually showing building the foundation of the new society um and i think that is the hopeful thing because there's so many movements like yours and they're everywhere and you can't stamp it out it's like ants just you know millions of ants you can't stop them because there's just too many of them so it looks like we've gone the wrong direction because the people in power are going one way but he ignited he reignited something in in modern society that that has not been stopped and has in fact just spread everywhere and even if you look at protest movements like extinction rebellion or whatever 
the central tenet of all those is decentralization and nonviolence. Mm-hmm. So in that sense, Gandhi has won that argument, you know. Can, can, I, can I just say, he didn't use these words again terms, but what we are talking about nowadays is uh, uh, solidarity economy. So people are saying that we have to work in solidarity with human to human, human to nature and all its species. And that's what he did without any any hesitation. He didn't, he, he just did it. He acted himself. And that was his, his, his magic, if you like. Yeah, he did it, he did it from, from the heart, but he had a way of communicating that as as have you know people oh, oh right is there, are you okay asha yeah sorry it went that's off. okay no i just i was gonna say uh, paul was talking about um archbishop tutu and the dalai lama and people like that there's there's other key figures isn't there who have that ability to pass on um put the, the the feeling from the heart into words and I was thinking when Paul was talking about all the ants <laughs> all of us ants trying to do things that you've got repair cafes you've got um, craft movements you've got all sorts of different grassroots movements at the bottom making things happen and I would argue that the um, play the, 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 the father and the assassin is, a, is performing an education role in that spreading the, the, the word further as well so there's a there's a whole heap of different things going on as you say Paul it's just trying to make those bigger changes higher up that we are going to have to keep working towards mm. which is interesting so um you talked there about non-violence and other philosophies in that gandhi promoted um paul i think you've given us a fair insight already but what of Ga- which of gandhi's teachings are important to you and, and how do you feel we can live by them today well i think he you know to, what the West likes to do to Gandhi is to go, oh, he was a brilliant politician, because they're comfortable with that part of his journey. Um, and what they're not comfortable with is talking about the fact that he was driven through through his spiritual life, as was the Dalai Lama, as was, uh, you, you know, as is all, all these great figures, Martin Luther King, it, their power came from the spiritual path they were pursuing um and so i think that's to me is the most useful what what is the most inspiring part of gandhi is that he you know he was a timid child full of fear he was a not very brilliant lawyer he was quite average because again he was so shy um he just you know when he was a young man in England he just thought but by by emulating the British he might gain some confidence and then he discovered the Gita again the Bhagavad Gita and he he kind of dived into his own cultural heritage and that is where he slowly remade himself um and that that idea of looking to say you um right means basically the means are the end so you cannot get right ends through wrong means and that's why he was against war because he said you can never get a good outcome from violence it just cannot happen it never will it's a it's a fallacy and so i think right means doing the work that is yours to do as close to you as possible with the people around you and trusting that that will um, translate into, into bigger change, I think is probably what I think, what I take away from him as, the, as an incredibly valuable teaching. Mm-hmm. Yeah, having faith in what you're doing, doing. Yeah, and the people around you. And the people around you. No, that's, that's lovely. Um, Asha, as you and I have talked about many times, we have a climate emergency looming, injustice in the world. It's easy to feel a bit negative, which you never are. Um, how can we encourage more people to embrace these values like non-violence and a simple, less consumerist way of living? Can I, I would like to mention Paul, I think he has used the word lack of ill will in his drama as a, a, as a word for ahimsa because he knows that ahinsa, we perceive violence as harming others physically. 
but that goes much more deeper than that. Mm. Founder of uh, Meta Center, Michael Nagler, based in USA, he said, a Himsa word uh, existed in Sanskrit and Hindi for millennia, mm. because that terms of a Himsa was existed in, in thousands for thousands, thousands of years. While in English, there is no word for ahimsa. So we used non-violence, that is, that which is not violent. So if you move away from harming others physically, whatever you think or speak or do, act, should be free from violence. Mm. So Paul <clears throat> would know manasa, vacha, and karmana. So by mind, in your mind, in your speech, in your action, you should be totally free from violence. And that is very hard to do. That's why people don't follow Gandhi, because it's difficult. But talking about consumerism, how can we say consumerism can be violent? Of course not, but think about it. If you take too much from the natural resources, you are committing theft because that's not just for you, that's for everybody on this world, and not body, every species in this world. So from there, start from there, and then go move forward to people who are producing them. When Joe, when you say, where does it come from? You are making us think, who made them? How is it made? How much labor they are spent on? how much reward they got it, in what condition they are working, how much profit is earned by the top people. So all these things make us think and that is that makes non-violent society. The reason we have war is because we are unequal. If we thought about all these things, people go shopping for want, not for need. They don't need a pair of trousers. They want it because it's in the shop and it's cheaper. Cheaper for you, but not for the people who are producing. They're putting the health on, on, on stake. So, yes, consumerism, and as Paul says, we call it sadhan shuddhi, because the means should be as just as pure as your own goal. And if they are not, you are committing crime. Crime against humanity, not against the state. Because state can punish you, mm. but the nature has a different way to punish you, mm. and we are suffering that. Mm. Punish all of us. Yes, punish all of us. Mm. And we always think that I can get away from it. It's not me, is it? It's him or her. Mm. No, exactly. And I, like, I like the thinking of, firstly, I like lack of ill will. That's a nicer phrase, a yeah. nicer way of yeah. looking at Even it. if it is your opponent. Mm. But also having ha having in having the thoughts in your head because I think that's the first stage. Isn't it? If you can eliminate the negative ill will thoughts from your head, firstly that's better for you, your mental health. Yeah. If you can just push them away, those thoughts away, and then the other side is that will prevent you from acting in a way that you wouldn't want to act. It's a it's but a meditation and calming helps with that, doesn't it? Because you then don't have the anger and the the stress there. But I'm sure that's a whole other discussion. For a whole other no, day. I think just to add to quickly to what Asha said there, what what I think is a, a, a problematic sometimes about the the green movement or whatever is that they make people think that they're having to give something up, and and you know when Asha says people go to the shops because they want stuff and they they do that is absolutely true, and I think it is because they they don't belong anymore. They don't belong, you know, if you talk to, if you, when you see indigenous people talking about their relationship with the land, they go, we belong to the land. We belong to this place. We are part of it. And so they have, because we have been removed from that, particularly in Western culture and cities, we have a deep loss inside us that we think we can meet with things because the loss is so huge that, that we can never fill it with things. And therefore consumerist culture keeps accelerating because we're desperately trying to fill the hole that is, that is left because we don't belong anymore. And so 
there's a double positive in what Gandhi's saying. What Gandhi's saying is if you return to the land, if you return to a sense of place, if you return to being able to make your own clothes, the need is filled. And so you're not having to give anything up to stop buying stuff because you won't want the stuff. It's like you're trying to eat lots of sugar in order to get sustenance, but it will never fill you up like proper food will. And so it's win-win. It's not we're having to give up all the nice, pretty, shiny things to live this kind of miserable, simple existence. The simplicity is the answer to the need that we are looking for. So it's, it's a, it's a part, we're gaining, we're gaining by doing this. We're not losing anything. Mm. Um, and I think that's the problem sometimes, you know, normal society goes, oh yeah, but you have to give up loads of stuff and just wear kind of horrid things. And, you know, it's like, no, the, the, the things we are gaining in every sense we gain, we don't lose anything by giving up all this horrid stuff. But that's a lovely, sympathetic, I would say, way of looking at it because people are so often blamed, aren't they? It's the way yeah. people behave is the way consumers yeah. behave. And I, I look back to lockdown. I mean, lockdown, but everyone was in terrible shock, you know, uh, across the world. But sort of in the UK, which I, I am, where, um, people were went through this terrible state of shock. And then we went through it. And then people were embracing nature, embracing bird song, um, not having to buy all these things. The shops were shut. It really wasn't the end of the world, apart from the people who hoarded toilet rolls. But, you know, most of us were, it just felt lovely. And you could go for a cycle and there weren't cars that you were frightened of. And then everyone there's so many conversations about is this going to carry on wouldn't it be great if we could stay like this but as soon as lockdown ended and it's happening still the push was no we have to get back to how we were before that's the right way to live because that's the as you've said before paul that's the way that makes these people money yeah whereas we couldn't so they wouldn't allow us to carry on with our simpler existence but i think also the problem was was that um it, actually what happened as well was that there was two things happening so we were living a simpler existence but we weren't living in community mm. and that's why people are desperate to go back because people missed human to human contact but what our consumerist culture tells us is that we're missing all the shiny stuff yeah and what it was was that if we could if we could have the simpler existence and be able to live in community with each other and hug people and be near people then you've got the best of both worlds i think Definitely. And that's what we missed, wasn't it? In lockdown, we missed just being with, with our loved ones. Yes, definitely. Huge. Overindulgence is the root cause of all our ills. Mm. Over greed. Mm. Nature is not greedy. It produces, it, it, it destroys things that, don't, that it doesn't need. And it always remains fresh. Mm. We need more than we require. Yes. That's the root cause of all ills. I mean, energy, you know, the, the energy side is a, a big one now as, as well, isn't it? And I'm very conscious of the time. And I'm sure Paul has to go and get ready to do some a show of to be Gandhi today, which is amazing. Um, is there anything else either of you would like to add where we can find you, where, the, where we can find out more about your thinking or anything you can recommend? Paul, do you want to go first? Well, um, uh, Asha has mentioned Michael Nagler at the Meta Centre. That's a really fantastic place to start. The Meta Centre Centre um, promotes Gandhi's work and you can find them online, themetacenter.org, I think you can find them and they have all the Gandhi resources you could want. They also have a lot of ways of translating that into modern um, society. Um, so I would recommend that. Asha, anything from you? Also, there is uh, mkgandhi.org, it's online portal and they, they produce articles uh, write about books uh, and you can have uh, one good thought every day posted to you just like Meta Center but also if you, if people are interested like where does it come from Khadi London and Action Village India in the UK that's people can visit and of course in India there are numerous Moral Fiber, Khamir and many more I'll put some links on on the blurb that goes with the podcast. And I think also we mustn't forget to encourage people to go to the National Theatre and watch Paul playing Gandhi in The Father and the Sa Assassin, which is but, an absolutely wonderful production. But I would also say if there's one thing you want to do to make yourself happier, find something like spinning, 
grow some food, try and do something that will simplify your life and make you more self-sufficient, <clears throat> whether it's to do with clothing or maybe even making a piece of furniture or just learning some kind of skill that connects you back further down to, to your sense of place will make you feel so good. Uh, I'm, I'm, I can't tell you how great the spinning's been. Oh. Although I don't think you could use much of the thread that I'm producing. <laughs> Asha, I'm a bit worried. It's 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 definitely of a, a pat patchy quality, I would say. I think that's the beauty, though, of um, yeah. cardi and other hand woven things. I mean, again, I keep keep going on about this scarf. This was a gift um, from the lady who runs Moral Fibre that Asha mentioned a minute ago. And if you you probably can't see if anyone's watching on the video, but the, there's a lot of disparity in the cloth. You know, and that's what gives it its uniqueness. You know, every single one will be different. And, and yeah. another um, interesting thing I wanted to quickly say, last weekend, or the weekend before last, I went to um, a farm up in Suffolk where I live, and they're actually starting to grow hemp, um, which in, across the UK, we grew hemp years ago. It was actually legally, you know, the law was you had to grow hemp if you had a farm back in Tudor times. And that's all been wiped out by commercialism and other, other things. So if we can grow hemp as a fabric again in the UK, we can spin and weave that in the same way as cardi and we have a again a locally grown locally produced cloth so fingers crossed i really hope that's something that we can be adding to our uk repertoire anyway without further ado i just want to say thank you both so much for joining us on the where does it come from podcast it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you both asha we're old friends paul i was a fan as an actor now i'm a fan as a person as well it's been wonderful to talk to you so thank you Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you.